Okay, all right. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, have some probably some more going in online. Um, but it's a pleasure to have uh, Hannes Bernie here from the University of Chicago. Uh, Hannes got his PhD in the Netherlands, uh, working on some pretty uh, foundational work using NV centers to measure measure group holes in bells and inequality. It's a really heroic experiment. So if you're, if you're at all familiar with, with anything like that, obviously it's kind of leads on that experiment. Um, he then went on from solid state systems to uh, a more pristine system to uh, into atomic systems uh, at Harvard working with Misha Lupin, where again, he did really, really pioneering experiments using uh, optical tweezers to control rubidium atoms and did some of the first uh, measurements of this uh, of this quote at the time as the 51 um, qubit uh, quantum simulator. Uh, and so since then, he's moved on to start his new zone group at uh, the University of Chicago, where they've been through species systems and atoms coupled to them. Alex, and so we're really excited to have him here and for a good time. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, LH, for the introduction and for having me here. You know, my first time here. It's really exciting to see all this, and I'm looking forward to talk to many more people and go to the discussions. Um, yeah, but now I'm excited to tell you about my research at the University of Chicago. And yeah, as Alex already said, we have these yeah, arrays of atoms. And what's special in our case is that we have these arrays uh, that are, uh, consist of two types of atoms, rubidium and cesium. And then what we would like to do is using this um, technique of optical tweezers to basically scale the systems, have many, many atoms, and then use it maybe in a quantum information or quantum simulation context. But we are also very interested in scaling the system by then finding ways how to connect basically these Arrays over long distances using light. So that's kind of the network part. And then the arrays is the quantum processor part of our research. Before I dig into the details, I like to zoom out and I, I love this historical slide. Uh, this is from Chris Monroe. I, I saw this talk, I think, more in 2010 at the beginning of my PhD. That was actually hugely motivating for me, uh, this talk. Kind of, it really made me enthusiastic about quantum information, quantum computing. And here in, in this talk, he in his intro, he compares different systems for yeah, realizing a quantum computer. So this is okay, this is some time ago. So it's kind of interesting to see what systems appear here. Of course, already that time we were thinking about individual atoms and photons. And Chris Monroe, of course, the pioneer in ion trap, and this is here at the very top. And then also there are solid state systems, superconductors already 2008 was kind of clear. This is a really promising system to realize qubits and, and maybe make more complicated uh, uh, chips out of that, semiconductors and also other condensed matter systems such as dopants or single, I don't know, phosphor donors and silicon. So this is kind of an interesting overview and Chris, uh, categorize these systems into two categories, into systems that scale. So, so maybe you could think solid state systems are somewhat manufacturable, so they might scale, and then systems that work. So, so these AMO systems, such as single atoms, single ions, what we love about them is that they are just very highly coherent by nature, and that uh, kind of probably led Chris to say these work. And these maybe that time were a little bit more noisy. I think by now actually also these solid state systems work quite nicely. But on the other hand, also now these AMO systems, they scale quite nicely. So, so I think it's a really interesting time where we have to kind of rethink what we conventionally thought scaling would mean. And uh, yeah, I think that's actually AMO systems in particular, neutral atoms, I believe have really a strong case for them. So what is the case? So the system I'm very excited about is trapping single atoms using tightly focused laser light, just like uh, what happens here in uh, Alex's lab. This is really catching yeah, the community by, uh, by storm. Using these optical tweezers, you can catch a single atom. But then if you have many of these tweezers, okay, you catch many of these atoms. And these, in, in my kind of, yeah, in my belief, these are just 
really good building blocks for large quantum systems. And I, I almost feel emotionally strong about this, uh, this uh, thing because sometimes I like to summarize my PhD where we did this loophole free band test at the end over a distance and spending basically two years to try to make two and these centers behave identically. So, so this was a lot of kind of engineering the, I don't know, the diamond around the MV center, then stark tuning it, and still that wasn't enough, like all kinds of little tricks or so. So then you have two MV centers the same, and then you can entangle them. Here, I mean, you just get it for free. You can have thousands of these tweezers. They are all the same. They're all highly coherent. So, so this is what makes me so excited about this research. So it's just this fact, I don't know, this, this makes me just so happy. <laughs> so, uh, but then, okay, there's more. These, these building blocks, they're highly coherent. Okay, I can always go back to MV centers. Or oh, let's go back to superconducting qubits. Maybe you measure coherence times in microseconds. Maybe you're pushing on milliseconds, which is very exciting. Okay, here with atoms, okay, you, you, we talked about seconds and and, and we can push this uh, uh, further, 10 seconds now observed and, and maybe even further. So this is super nice coherent building block. And then, okay, the ingredient, I think since maybe, yeah, maybe since 2016, 17, that really has just shown to be a perfect match, I think, to these tweezers are these Rydberg interactions where we excite a couple atoms to these highly um, principal quantum number states that we can get very strong interactions between the atoms even over micrometers and these interactions they can be very coherent which then leads for example now to two qubit gate fidelities of 99.5 percent and higher so this is actually all pretty rapid developments over the last few years and here just to show some highlights I don't know, you have now quantum simulation. Okay, maybe in my poster there was 51 atoms. Now, this is these are hundreds of atoms in, in 2D geometries. So this is very interesting. Also now on the quantum computing front, people really yeah, compile basically quantum algorithms onto these atomic arrays. And this is 2022, the qubit number wasn't that high. But okay, since then, two qubit gate fidelities goes up. People scale the system. Actually, this is more like investigating maybe quantum advantage in, in the many body system. But now maybe the most recent highlight is really using hundreds of atoms to define logical qubits and then even perform logical gate operations between them. So, so it's a, I mean, this is really just the last two years a kind of, of, of highlights. Um, and there are actually many, many more highlights. So it's a rapidly expanding field. But I think there's still so much to do. And then there's actually like so much room, actually, what I love about it for creativity. So for example, here, this highlight on the logical qubit algorithms relies on the fact that actually the systems are very coherent, but I can actually also move them around, change connectivity, even within an algorithm. This is something I would say maybe that wasn't really anticipated that that's possible. And now really kind of puts the whole thing on the next level. So, so I think we might, see even more of these steps uh, kind of uh, so it's uh, super exciting so but okay um all of these examples that you see here they are single species examples okay we do dual species we do dual species to i would say address some of the outstanding challenges of course there's uh, not everything is perfect about atoms and these are just some examples measurements for instance take quite long if you want to determine the qubit state takes quite long. It's also often very destructive on, on the atoms. Often you just throw away all the atoms in one qubit state, and then you just check who is left, basically, to determine the state. Atoms anyway get lost all the time, like they get lost out of the tweezer due to background gas collision. And then, okay, I, I think it's super exciting that we can scale to hundreds of atoms, even thousands of atoms. At some point, you are going to run out of space in your microscope and you want some way to connect to another module. And okay, this is kind of what we try to address uh, in our research. On the dual species front, actually, these ideas are not super new. What I actually love in quantum research is drawing inspiration from other architectures. So quantum systems that use two different qubit modalities are actually very abundant. Superconducting qubits, for instance, here, could think about this Google quantum advantage chip, the Sycamore chip, and then you think about, I don't know, 53 or 54 qubits. Actually, there are many more qubits on this chip. 
but they uh, fulfill a different role. They just kind of mediate gates between these computational qubits. So, so you could have qubits that mediate interactions, or you could have qubits here in NV centers that are just very long lived, that are some kind of quantum memory nuclear spins around an electron spin in these centers, very similar in quantum dots. This is a familiar story. And then something that's a bit closer to neutral atoms are, of course, trapped ions. And also in trapped ions, dual species was used for a long time, for instance, to do sympathetic cooling of one uh, ion using the other species. So, so there's a lot of advantage having this. And okay, this is maybe also some of our motivation, why we would want to do a species array. At its core, what it gives us is independent control. Like these two atoms, they have very different optical transitions, qubit transitions. So I can independently control one, maybe independently measure one without affecting the other. So we are eliminating crosstalk. And I will show you how we can use that to perform very non-destructive measurements. Also um, a nice way, I'm going to show you an example to overcome in, in some specific scenarios, atom loss using this. And then actually the dual species we will see actually changes the story of Rydberg a little bit. We get different types of interactions that we could use for efficient state preparation, efficient multi-qubit gates. I think there's actually a lot to do also in front of many bodies. And, and, and that's what we are very interested in. And this kind of addressing maybe the first two or three challenges, and then the connection between distant modules is something we are addressing by making photonic interfaces. These are photonic cavities, and I will talk about that also in my talk. Um, yeah, so, so this is on the menu today. First, tell you about our dual species array, show you a little example where we use this crosstalk free nature to do something useful. And um, then I'm going to show you what happens when we excite these dual species to Rydberg states, and what is maybe a bit different than the single species uh, Rydberg states. And then I'm going to talk about these photonic interfaces to connect over long distance. And we, of course, can make this very interactive. So feel free to ask questions also within the talk. Uh, we also don't have to finish everything, like it's <laughs> also uh, nice to, to just. Uh, and discuss during. So, so this is our little sketch of um, our dual species setup. These experiments, of course, they happen in some vacuum chamber. It's microscopy, so there must be some microscope. And then, okay, these optical tweezers, there are now many different ways how you could generate them. Some of these ways here, these spatial light modulators, they are not so different from maybe the, the projector we have here. In the projector, we have one light source. We have some kind of pixel array to steer that light source onto all these different pixels. So here's the same. We send one laser on the spatial light modulator. We can then distribute that laser light over many spots. And those are then many optical tweezers that could potentially trap single atoms. In our case, because we have dual species, a lot of the things we have double. We have one spatial light modulator for our cesium atoms, one for rubidium atoms. So we can independently position them and independently trap them. And then uh, we can also, using this acoustic optic deflector, then move the atoms around. That, that's, um, but this is actually a common one that can move either rubidium or cesium. And then, um, yeah, this is what I just said. In reality, this looks like this. I don't know, um, I mean, it's just a vacuum chamber, kind of an upside down vacuum chamber. All the interesting stuff happens down there. But before we get to the interesting stuff, we have to start with some atoms up here. In the 2D magneto-optical trap, the atoms get pushed down. Then, okay, here we form a cool cloud of atoms. And then we shine in our optical tweezers, catch those uh, atoms. And then through the same microscope objectives here, we also image them or can send some control light in. So, so this is actually very convenient. And yeah, our upside down, design to make sure that all the sensitive stuff is where it's most stable. At least that's the idea. Um, okay, so how does it work? Well, this is a picture of now our maybe largest arrays of rubidium atoms in, in blue, cesium atoms in yellow. And okay, these are 512 sites. Um, for the experts, this is an average image. Uh, these optical tweezers, they probabilistically load 
um, maybe with 50% chance to get an atom or you don't get an atom, but then you can actually use this acoustic optic deflector to move atoms around and make defect free arrays. We are doing that, not quite on like so large array, but we can uh, also make defect free arrays. But this is an average image. And then because we have spatial light modulators, we can put them in all kinds of positions and we can make some outreach figures of Chicago landmarks. Um, it's nice to move the CS tower, this is the beam. And then the selling point is that we now have a two color scheme on other experiments where we have a single color scheme, that's something. And then, okay, this rearrangement I'm showing here on a more smaller instance. So, so here, this is what you would see in a single shot. You just take a single shot of these are just four lines of optical tweezers. And then uh, maybe yeah, about 50 to 60% are loaded. Then you take this image, you see where they are, and then you use this acoustic optic deflector to, to move them into these defect free arrangements. And okay, this is a little bit on a smaller scale. But in principle, we can also do it on these larger scales. So this is nice. Uh, we can take nice pictures. But the question was, okay, can we do something useful with this? Um, and, and here's one little story where this maybe is already something useful. So, so the story is the following. Maybe, yeah, yeah. imagine you have your, your quantum processor, you have some chip or some atom array, and the quantum processor, of course, uh, there might be noise in the background, might be noise in the environment that causes decoherence. Um, ultimately, maybe we want to do quantum error correction. Okay, quantum error correction is also quite costly. So, so maybe there's a different way of overcoming certain types of noise. And the idea here is, if I just had a sensor that is co-located with my quantum processor, I could measure the noise in real time, and in real time, maybe adjust my pulses on my computational qubits to correct any kind of phase uh, error I, I pick up. So this is the idea. This idea kind of uh, was here in, 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 in uh, some theory papers. They call it the spectator qubits. So these sensors are the spectators that are co-located with my computational qubits. They measure in real time what the uh, noise is. And then uh, we, we can in real time use that information and correct what it's not. Um, of course, this only works for particular noise. The, the, the errors on my computational qubits, here we will just use the rubidium atoms, has to be correlated with on my spectator qubits. Uh, so, so it corrects for correlated noise. But that's maybe also a nice feature because a lot of quantum error correction protocols actually struggle with correlated noise, especially if it's strong correlated noise. And, okay, I think this is also a nice protocol because in the end of the we want to do quantum error correction, but this is something that you can use on top of it. I mean, if you have some spare qubits that could just monitor noise, why not use that extra information to uh, uh, correct for correlated noise? Um, these proposals, they were mainly for superconducting qubits and trapped ions, and they had to be realized because the requirements, I think, are quite high. You have to be able to extract information out of the spectators without making life harder for the computational uh, qubits. So you want to have this readout, we call this mid-circuit readout without decohering data qubits. You want to have fast measurements. So here for the superconducting qubits, they were thinking, oh, set apart maybe one qubit and measure it many times to get some information. So that's actually uh, pretty tough. And then you want to have real-time processing and feed forward to, to do this. So, but yeah, I will show you atom arrays are actually really good for all of these points. So this is, of course, we use a dual species array. Now we don't just take pretty pictures on these optical transitions, but we also use the qubit states here. And the same thing about independent control still holds. Now, just deciding which microwave tone we shine in, we can decide which of the qubits we manipulate. And then here you just see simple Rabi oscillation by shining in some microwaves into our vacuum chamber. Yeah, this is simple Rabi oscillation. We can make it slightly more interesting by doing some kind of echo sequence or dynamically decoupling sequence. So here on Rubidium, we do this eight pulses around different axes to see what our coherence time T2 is. If we do that, this is what we get for the coherence time. So, so we do these pulses, sweep the face here in the end, check what our contrast is, and then check how that contrast decays over time. 
And then this is not this is not record breaking. We didn't do anything special or so, but this is kind of what you very typically, without doing anything special, get is about half a second coherence time here. Now the question for us actually was what happens to this coherence time on the rubidium if we also include the spectator qubits, our uh, cesium qubits. And uh, when we do that, okay, here are now more microwave sizes on cesium, and importantly, a lot of laser light to determine what the state of cesium is. And this laser light also hits the rubidium atom, but it's at a very different uh, wavelength. And then this now here, this new color is also rubidium data. So we just want to see, does this have any effect on rubidium? And it just turns out that it does not. The coherence time basically doesn't change. You could just say rubidium doesn't care whatever you do to cesium. So there's no crosstalk between them in the escape operations and in this readout. And now okay, we've gained something. We actually have this readout result and we can do something with that readout result. So, so this is now implementing this whole spectator protocol. Uh, this is the pipe sequence we do. We still do these microwave pipes on rubidium, and then we shine in some magnetic field noise. And so we shine in some magnetic field noise, the fixed frequency, but with a random phase. So in each shot of the experiment, we actually don't know what the effect of the noise is. Every time, depending on this phase, the qubits would get rotated into like a different direction. Or uh, over a different angle. So if we do that and then perform this coherence measurement, looking for the contrast again, then okay, the contrast is completely gone. Then now, now the spectator qubits come to help. So, so as this random noise shines in, we are picking up some random rotations here on the block sphere of our of our uh, computational qubit. But we also pick up random rotations on the spectator qubits. These angles are correlated with each other. They are different angles, but there's a simple kind of multiplication factor in between. And then we can measure this angle, estimate what this angle is, and then correct for that angle by basically adjusting just this final phase on, 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 on this uh, pi over two pi. So, so we estimate, we calculate to, to know what, what the angle is, and then if we apply that, we can actually regain this coherence. So here in real time, we react to what the noise does, and we make things better for the computational qubit. So, so, so that was was kind of a nice first useful example where, where I think in this case uh, the dual species really came. So yeah. Then okay, let's move on unless there are questions for that. Um I, like uh, the total honest story, actually, here comes my uh, experimentalist honest story. Uh, when we set up the lab, we immediately wanted to do this. We wanted to show that we can have interactions between the, the qubits and, and, and then do all great things. Uh, a lot of laser troubles and laser broken. So we couldn't do this, um, but we knew that we would have kind of this special readout without, uh, um, without decoherence. So, so this mid circuit readout, we wanted to show that. And then we were thinking, okay, what interesting test case could we construct where okay, the atoms don't couple to each other because we don't have interaction. But then we were thinking, okay, maybe they couple to the same environment. And then uh, that actually we came up with the spectator protocol and then realized, okay, that's actually a thing in the papers on that. Um, but okay, then a few years later, we actually finally got all the Rydberg lasers we needed. And, and now we can make interactions. So let me tell you about these Rydberg interactions in this dual species setting. So Rydberg interactions, I mean, the, 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 the goal is just now over these micrometer distances, the atoms are maybe typically three, four, five micrometer away. Atoms don't interact at all. Like maybe there's a spin, but the spin interaction would be like millihertz or something like that. Now, now if we excite them to these highly excited states, these Rydberg states can get super strong dipolar interactions or Van der Waals interactions over micrometer distances that could be on the gigahertz range. So, so, so this is really, really sizable, very strong. And in our case, okay, we have two species. That's true for cesium, that's true for rubidium. Um, but the question is, okay, what happens between rubidium and cesium? So here's a, just a little calculation. 
uh, what happened uh, to, to that. So here you see for particular Rydberg states, in this case, the 68S state, you see this one over R to the six uh, interaction between cesium, cesium, rubidium, rubidium, and also rubidium, cesium. So, so here we have a situation where all the interactions, I would say they are pretty similar. They are all on the same scale. This is already actually a very interesting regime, I think, because, okay, everything looks the same, but actually we have this independent control. We can decide does only the rubidium interact, does only the cesium interact, or do they interact with each other when we shine in all the layers? So that's nice. But there's something more. We can actually now just by slightly changing this state, for example, rubidium to the 68S state, cesium to the 67S state, we actually change these one over R to the six interactions to one over R to the three interactions. So, so it's much stronger, or it stays uh, much longer. And then we get much stronger interspecies interactions than the same species interaction. And that's a regime we are very interested in. Here, you could already kind of imagine you could have one atom, maybe one cesium atom, and then control many rubidium atoms around it. And this is kind of the idea that we have to, for instance, do very efficient multi-qubit gates. So this is, I mean, this is just the Rydberg story, but the Rydberg story a little bit changed because now we have dual species. So, so we wanted to see if we can see that in the experiment. So okay, this is now the experiment. We added these lasers, Rydberg lasers. Um, and, and also, okay, Rydberg states, they are quite sensitive to electric fields. So in our vacuum chamber, we actually have these electric field plates to, to change electric fields. Also, these electric field plates, they're actually quite nice. They also, uh, they also, there's actually Faraday cage. There are many, many different, many, many small wires across these openings. And then with that, actually these simulations, so we can also suppress electric field noise from, uh, from the outside. So, uh, this, I think, works, but we still have to systematically char uh, characterize it. Plus, it's also nice that these uh, plates, they're all independent, so we can apply the electric field in any direction that we would want. Then, okay, these Rydberg transitions. In our case, we use two photon transitions. So these are our qubit states, rubidium, cesium. Here are our Rydberg states where we want to get to. We don't go there in a single step. That would be a very ultraviolet light and not so nice to deal with. Instead, we use two laser wavelengths to go via an intermediate state to these Rydberg states. And this, this is also kind of one of the troubles of the experiments. Now you need four lasers. These Rydberg states, they are very long lived. That kind of means that you want very narrow lasers. So, so there is quite some kind of finicky laser locking and, and these wavelengths are not the best wavelengths that go into this. So that's why maybe it took a little long. Now we got all these four lasers, we got them on resonance, and then we can look, uh, I mean, we, we can encode our information in the hyperfine states, and, and then we can use these Rydberg states to get interactions between them. And here's a little example of our Faraday cage or, or electric field states working quite nicely and shifting here these Rydberg states as we apply different voltages. We have pretty nice electric field control, which is also a nice feature. So now I'm coming back to the story of okay interspecies versus inner species interaction. And okay, I showed you the plot that when we excite to the same Rydberg states, here now the 67S state, we would expect this one over R to the six potential. So, so we excite to these states and we just perform spectroscopy. So here you see spectroscopy and the colors here, the distance is encoded. So as we get closer and closer, we see larger and larger interaction shapes, basically. And then the story is quite different when you decide to, now you just change the wave, laser wavelength for rubidium and instead of the 60S state, you decide to the 68S state. Now, what you have is actually, you have a resonance between the 68S state rubidium, 67S state cesium, has exactly the same energy as the 67P three half state and the 67P one half state on rubidium. And this uh, resonance is called the first resonance. And now you have these uh, transition dipoles being exactly on resonance. And now we get this dipolar interaction, this one over R to the three interaction. And actually when you measure this, actually the states that you get in the excited state because they're exactly on resonance, 
we get this symmetric and anti-symmetric superposition of the 68 and 67 S state. And, and that's why qualitatively you already see this interactions is really different. Like we get these two branches basically. And then also quantitatively it's different. Like we go to similar distances, but here you see the shift, okay, seems to be quite a bit higher than, than here. And then, then if we look at that, maybe more summarized, you see here in purple, this is the first resonance between rubidium and cesium. We see the two branches and we see the scale is quite a bit higher than all other combinations here. Yellow is just ruby, cesium with cesium, blue is rubidium with rubidium, and green is rubidium cesium, but in this 68, 67S configuration. So all of this becomes a bit clearer when you plot it on a logarithmic uh, plot. You see exactly here this one over R to the six uh, interaction, and then for the first there resonance one over R to the three, and then you can pick your distance basically where you would have maybe 10 times stronger uh, interspecies interaction than in this interaction. So this is uh, quite special. And, and this is then where we kind of put ourselves in the world performing experiments. So this was fun. I mean, I'm not so used to doing spectroscopy, but you uh, with that spectroscopy. Is there a uh, why is it not symmetric about the deep tuning? Um, yeah, I think okay. I think if we would have exactly tuned it to the first resonance, it should be oh, symmetric. So, so there's still a little bit of a, of a um, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Also, there's like some fun little technical details. But I, it's actually not so easy to excite to this double excited Rydberg state. It's not so easy. But for us, it, here again, a feature of the dual species, what we, the way we did the spectroscopy, we first just do a pi pulse on one species, and then we just do spectroscopy on the other, whereas now the shift that other one. So, so that actually makes this spectroscopy way easier than directly trying to go to the double excited state. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly where we have the laser spots. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's a great, uh, great question. So, so, um, so these spot sizes, they are maybe on a micrometer or so, and now it's about okay. Actually, okay, you can rethink of it as a harmonic potential, and then you think. Okay, either a first classic E of the atom, like a ball in the potential. So it really depends actually on the temperature of the atom, how much of, of this uh, potential uh, or the, the kind of distance, different distances you sample. And indeed here we sample many different distances. I would say maybe the separation between atoms can vary by a few hundred nanometers mm -hmm. or, or maybe even half a micrometer here. Uh, yes. And it's a, uh, and that kind of can have consequences for the experiments. It, it can be if you perform an experiment that really depends on the exact value of the interaction, then okay, then you get maybe a lot of um, uh, uh, disorder in this. But with this Rydberg, uh, the hallmark of Rydberg is Rydberg blockade, and Rydberg blockade is actually largely insensitive, uh, as I will also show to the distance. Right. So now, okay, yeah, this is a good segue into Rydberg blockade. <laughs> no. uh, what we want to show is basically, yeah, th then we can use these interactions to yeah, influence the dynamics of one atom by the other. So, so here the story, again, is the same. We do Rabi oscillations, but now we do Rabi oscillations on the ground to Rydberg state, so not the microwave, but here the, the Rydberg light can either rotate the cesium atoms or the rubidium atoms. So these are just independent Rabi oscillations. For the experts, they, they kind of see all the things that are wrong with our experiment. We don't have the highest, it doesn't go from zero to one. We have like some uh, atom loss kind of detection. Oh, oh, we don't have the best optical pumping. This is actually one of the big reasons for that. And then you also see that this actually decays. Uh, still, our lasers have to be better locked. But okay, here we just, it's more we want to show the features, the fidelity we are working on now, these features. But the feature we want to show is what happens 
to the dynamics of the single cesium atom that here is just independently rotated when we put the rubidium atom in a reverse state. And here again, you see kind of the independent control, which would be difficult in a single species experiment without kind of focusing laser light on the individual atom. Here we just chime in now this rubidium ground to Rydberg pipeline. And then we try to drive here the cesium uh, dynamics. And then you see the cesium dynamics is largely flat. And this is exactly the blocking. The, the uh, first putting the rubidium in the Rydberg state shifts now the cesium energy and then okay we are not on resonance with the cesium uh, uh, state anymore and, and we don't excite it and this is uh, in the Rydberg blockade okay you shift it out of resonance but it doesn't matter by exactly how much so it's in some sense distance less sensitive to these fluctuations to the atoms in the twitter and and this uh, Rydberg blockade is then really what underlies all kind of gate protocols now we want to encode information in our hypertime states here just use the Rydberg states in between to perform a gate. I'm going to show you a very original gate. So, so actually, all of this goes back to maybe 2000. Peter Yaksh and co workers they came up with this gate protocol, with, which now maybe in the community people call the Pi 2 Pi Pi protocol. Basically, you first perform a Pi Pi's on, on your Control atom, and, and then you two pipe files on the other atom, and then another pipe files on, on, on your control atom. And basically, you see because of Rydberg blockade, if you perform this two pipe rotation on rubidium, depends if you started in this state or this state. So, so these uh, ground Rydberg files, they are only on resonance with the one state to the Rydberg state, not with the zero state. So you kind of already see, okay, there's a conditional two pi rotation on rubidium, and okay, on a two pi rotation, you pick up a minus sign. So this is a conditional phase. And um, I, I, I would really say this is the original. People don't do this so much anymore uh, for, for various reasons. But actually, one reason why people don't do that in a single species experiment is because you need the individual control. You need to focus laser light on this and on that atom. And it's a little bit more difficult maybe with Rydberg light, and, and then you actually care about like these position fluctuations because we have different rally frequencies. For us here, okay, we have the built in individual control, so it's just these big laser beams that we apply in this sequence. So, so this was very easy for us. And okay, if it's easy, then you do it. <laughs> so, so this is what we did. So, so here we do this, we kind of embed it in, in some additional type type, uh, and, and, and then what you see here is basically the phase. On the rubidium, if cesium is in zero state or if cesium is in one state, seeing so see exactly the C phase state. There's also a different reason, maybe. Yeah, I mean, these gates by, by now they are much nicer protocols. Also, uh, Alex implemented really nice protocols on Ethereum getting very high fidelities. This is not, I will show you our fidelities are not the greatest. Uh, but what is actually very nice about this protocol, if you are in this asymmetric interaction regime, you can actually very easily now have one control atom and multiple target atoms around it. So then suddenly you can actually apply the same pile sequence to maybe a plaquette configuration where you have one cesium atom in the middle, rubidium atoms around it, and what you will get is a multi-control phase gate. So, so they are very nice extensions of this protocol for dual species that immediately would give you a stabilizer on a plaquette. But that's another reason why we're actually very interested in this people would say maybe old and not so good protocol. Actually, I think maybe in the dual species context makes a lot of sense. Okay, and once you have a gate, the thing you normally do with the gate, you make entanglement. So, so we also made entanglement. Now we decorate our C phase gate with a little bit more pi over two pulses. We get a C not gate. And okay, then we get entanglement that we characterize in the computational basis and then the phase. And okay, it's clearly entangled. It's, it, we see the correlations, we see the phase, but it's also clearly not any record breaking fidelity. So here the fidelity is around 70%. It's entangled. We very well understand what our error budget is. It's mainly our lasers being very noisy. That's what we are working on now. But okay, here, I mean, the feature is it's the first dual species uh, entanglement. And then what's for us particularly exciting is now using this entanglement in combination with the readout that we have already demonstrated. 
So the idea is now you can perform a readout where you, with the two qubit gates, first map or correlate your state of the computation qubit with your auxiliary qubit, and then you read that out. So you just perform basically a C0 gate between these two. Then you can perform a mid circuit readout on one. This kind of our histogram on the mid circuit readout. We can nicely distinguish uh, our two states in this. And, and, and then you still have the Rubinium atom there. And you didn't. And you didn't destroy the rubidium atom. Of course, you performed the measurement, you projected it, but okay, now you can continue with it. So we just characterize this readout by preparing different input states on, 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 on rubidium and then seeing what we see on cesium. So if we, when we prepare zero, we measure zero on cesium. This the high chance, of course, this is now limited by the same kind of fidelity limits on, on the entangled state. So not too surprising that this is around 78%. But then when we prepare the other state, then we uh, also see that with a high chance, we see that state. So again, lots to improve. Actually here, if you only care about readout, you could actually do this readout repetitively. You could get, get a, a not great readout, 70%, but you can actually do it again and again. After you projected it, you can do uh, these gates again. And um, yeah, so, so, so the fidelity of this readout is about 76%. But the nice thing is really now thinking about these protocols maybe on the plaquette, measuring a stabilizer. Yeah, so so that's kind of what we are working on now. And do I still have a bit of time or so? So, so because now I do the big jump. So, so there are questions on this, uh, and we can also discuss later. Because now I'm going to do this big jump from everything kind of local, these arrays, interactions to now trying to somehow span the distance between distance at the uh, arrays uh, doing these uh, photonic interfaces. Okay, so, so let's do that. Let, let me uh, motivate that a little bit. And okay, one motivation, I think there are lots of motivations why you would want like distributed entangled states, but one is simply a practical reason is, okay, we have now thousands of atoms. I mean, not our group, but other groups have thousands of atoms under these microscopes. I totally foresee this actually still scaling maybe towards 10,000 of atoms. I think at 10,000 of atoms, then it will get difficult. And then, okay, I would argue 10,000 is super exciting, but okay, if you're very serious about like scaling and error corrected processors, then that's not enough. So, so you need some way of maybe connecting now different modules together. Here's a very nice uh, work I really enjoyed from Vlad and Bulutic group that just thought about, okay, Okay, I want to do error correction. Maybe I want to do a surface code. What happens if I split my surface code into two patches? And the scenario would be, okay, I have two processors and they are somewhat, they are connected here uh, along this uh, seam. And what they found in their work, and it's really nice, is actually that the requirements on this seam, basically you could say maybe the fidelity of bad pairs that you need to share between the uh, processors are not that high. Actually, you can maybe tolerate up to 10% errors on these band pairs and still have a fully functioning surface code. So, so, so that, that's actually highly encouraging uh, because it's quite difficult to make these connections. Okay, the connections actually don't have to be that good, not as good as your inner module gates and all your operations there. So this, this is one motivation. So, so you want some way to distribute entanglement between computational qubits. Here's a little overview. It's very busy. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So, so this is uh, this is from a little review paper that we wrote on basically sampling the space of experiments that have connected computational qubits over a distance. And actually, I mean this this is a very exciting field. I find it exciting that it has been done with many different systems and these centers, silicon vacancy centers, quantum dots, trapped ions, neutral atoms. And here I'm summarizing all of these experiments. Okay, the x axis is easy. This is distance. The y axis is a bit different. The y axis shows link efficiency. And link efficiency is just a figure of merit that maybe the community agreed upon might be something not meaningful, which is just the coherence time times the entanglement rate. So basically, what it means is can you distribute entanglement faster than you actually use a loose coherence? So you would argue, okay, if you want to do this. Okay, your, your entanglement needs to be sufficiently fast that not everything kind of decoheres in the meantime. So being at a link efficiency larger than one is a meaningful thing. 
And actually, you see there's only very few experiments that have managed to do that. Actually, the large spike of experiments is maybe at the 10 to the minus 5 range. So, so, so entanglement is slow, I would say. And it gets slower and slower the longer you go. Okay, these are, of course, like photonic losses. And so so um, I think atoms can play a actually large role in, in, in bringing this high up. The other key takeaway from this plot is actually that most experiments that have been performed, they just have connected one qubit with one qubit over here. If you would have now an atomic array here and there, you could actually run entanglement in parallel. You could do multiplexing. And then, okay, you would actually boost this rate by the number of atoms, basically. So, so that's one motivation why you would want to maybe combine atomic arrays with photonic interfaces. This is a, this is a proposal from Mark Sachman's group or a nice technical analysis, what would happen if you put dual species arrays in like a macroscopic optical cavity. And then uh, another approach, I mean, these optical cavities now provide the photonic interface. Then you collect the photon, and you do a base state measurement to uh, generate entanglement in these distant modules. And then another uh, maybe alternative approach would be to use a different cavity geometry here. These are these nanophotonic crystal cavities. And this is work that I've also been involved uh, as a postdoc in, uh, where you can now put these optical tweezers on these photonic crystal cavities to cup into the light field. And here we uh, made entanglement between the atoms. Then you can actually transport the atoms away from this photonic interface. So also this would integrate with uh, atomic arrays. Um, in, in my research at Chicago, we are very interested in actually being able to also go to very long distances. So so the, you saw this link efficiency plot just kind of uh, uh, went all the way down the further you went. And yeah, the reason are photon losses. So if you want to go long distance, what you have to do, you have to work at telecom uh, wavelength. And okay, most atoms don't have telecom transitions. There are some special cases. I think that also Alex is uh, interested in the terbium atoms, maybe from their long lived metastable states, they have some interesting transitions. The terbium for my group is way too complicated. So, so we like uh, rubidium and cesium. And actually, if you extend your search radius, not just to transitions from the ground state, you also find telecom transitions between excited states. And this is actually kind of generally true for any atom. Like if their atoms have a lot of levels, some levels will be at telecom uh, the wavelengths. So, so those are the transitions we are interested in. And then we were interested in, can we come up with a protocol that generates entanglement between these long-lived qubit states and the hyperfine uh, uh, manifold that are then entangled with the emission of a telecom photo. And, and here's a protocol that we came up with. So the qubits would be here encoded in the hyperfine states. This is the telecom photo we want. And basically it's a coherent process where we couple one of the states to then this cavity emission telecom photon. And then we can correlate the state zero with the, with the telecom photon. And if we actually do a pipe sequence, when we first create the superposition of zero and one, then we take this little round trip, emit half a photon. We have a superposition here, we emit half a photon. Then we flip the superposition and do another round trip. Then you get like a photon that is distributed over two emission time bins, early and late, that are entangled with the zero and the one state. So this is a very nice atom photon entangled state. I really like this time bin entangled state. And what we've analyzed, okay, this would be the kind of the pipe sequence to take it on a little round trip uh, here. And we see, okay, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but you basically see here in blue, the population in this state goes on a little round trip and comes back and on the round trip emitted a telecom photo. And we see that the fidelity of this process or the infidelity scales not too surprisingly with how well you couple it to the cavity, so with the cooperativity. And cooperativities of like few tens, close to a hundred, have been achieved with this architecture. And then you would look at errors on the on the percent level. So, so this would be really interesting. And actually, this was kind of a little theoretical exercise in the beginning that then convinced us, okay, let's let's really do this. Let's create an experiment, let's make devices. So, so these are photonic devices that we make, also in collaboration with Argon National Lab, uh, where these I don't know, needles, uh, they are all nanophotonic crystal cavities. And these, okay, 
um, without going into the details, is this nanofabricated holes in a one-dimensional waveguide that then confine the light into the cavity area that is maybe here. And then these uh, nanophotonic crystal cavities, uh, they are exactly or very close to the resonance of our single helicon transition. They have good quality factors, so everything looks quite nice. Um, there, there are a few more, I would say, advances or challenges that we were facing. I mean, now the question is, okay, the light is in the cavity, how do you get it out? What, one way that was popular, or maybe is still popular, is you could actually attach a fiber to these devices. But okay, this is a really cumbersome process and then maybe not super well controlled process. And then you don't want to do it for many, many devices. So in our case, we actually took some inspiration also from the work in Jet Kinmill's lab uh, that also Alex was involved in. Uh, I think it's nicely described here that you can actually take light out of devices, and just launch it into a free space mode and then match that free space mode nicely to maybe your coupling objective that you have outside the vacuum chamber. So this is a, like a little simulation where we uh, choose here the launching mode to match nicely the coupling mode of, a, of an objective. And then we simulate that we can maybe couple 90% of the photons into an objective. I'm always a bit skeptical with the numerical simulations. They look very nice and very promising. But I don't think we convinced ourselves that that's actually the case or that it's at least promising. So this is one of our chips. On the chips, okay, we have these uh, needles that actually overhang to the edge of the chip. And then uh, here we, we actually, this is data where we couple to these devices and we get about 60% coupling efficiency, which I'm actually very happy with. I, I think it can still be optimized. Then we get closer to these values, but actually 60% I'm already happy with. So this is one of the challenges. So it's nice we can have an objective outside the vacuum chamber to couple to different devices. Another challenge is actually when you want to combine or yeah, I will get to that uh, challenge actually in, in a second. So, so, so uh, you will see that challenge very quickly. But our vacuum chamber now okay, is the same thing. We have microscope objectives, acoustic optic detectors, but we have a chip inside now. And then we have this other viewport to collect uh, the, the emission from these photonic devices. This is what it looks like in reality. So it's actually a very nice uh, small setup. And then, okay, here we look through the viewport where the microscope objective normally goes in, and you see the uh, photonic chip there. So now, okay, we can move the atoms, we can move the atoms close to the chip, but there's like still some challenges. So for instance, when you image atoms, typically you scatter photons from some laser that excites the atom. And then okay, you shine in the laser maybe from a different direction and you look here with your microscope objective, so you only see the scattered light. Now, okay, we just kind of put uh, a lot of stuff into the vacuum chamber. Now we have a lot of scattering from our nanophotonics. So, so if we would do just the simple thing on our camera, we would be completely blind, basically. So, so, so we can't see single atoms, single photons coming from atoms on top of the very large background coming from these devices. Okay, what, what we then did to overcome it is basically to already use our kind of level scheme that later we want to use for entanglement generation. But here we use it without a cavity. We just use the fact that when we do a round trip, we emit photons that are at a different wavelength than where we excite. And then we can actually just spectrally filter out the excitation from, from, the, from the detection. And then we can actually close to the nanophotonic chip image single atoms in this uh, background free method. That's actually uh, quite nice. So that works well. Now we can see the atom, we can see a whole array and actually put the array next to the chip or even interweave it here with the uh, nanophotonics. So this is uh, really kind of looking through the same microscope objective. We, we can trap atoms very nicely and we can cool them. So all of the things you would want from atom arrays, they, they work nicely. We can even put the atoms on top of these uh, photonic chips now and on top of these devices. Of course, here I'm only showing you like an X and Y. They seem to be at the right spot. But we are also convinced that in, in, in the Z position, they're at the right spot. And the way we convince ourselves is when you shine an optical tweezer on these nanophotonic devices, some of the tweezer light gets reflected, and then it forms a standing wave. So you actually get these nodes and anti-nodes uh, uh, that are referenced to the device. 
And then this light actually shifts the transitions of the atoms so they're from stark shift and we can measure this stark shift. We see here when the atom is in between these devices, okay, we get this stark shift, whereas on top of the devices, we get much higher stark shift and that puts us at, yeah, at some distribution of these different states, but maybe in 30, 40% of the cases, we are very close to the uh, nanophotonic device. So, so we are maybe a few hundred nanometers away and we would expect at that distance to see strong coupling between the device. I'm, I'm not going to show you that because it just turned out that our chip is a little too far off resonance. So we couldn't couple uh, this chip uh, to, to the atom and, and now we're fabricating a new chip and putting that in. But here's some more like things you would expect from atom arrays, but now in the context of, of uh, nanophotonics combination, so from atom arrays, I've showed you rearrangement. Here we can now do rearrangement onto the chip. So, so here we first randomly load an atom array, a small one, just like we have eight or nine traps here, randomly load four atoms, and then move the atoms onto these four nanophotonic chips. And then another thing, I mean, for these devices, it's not that interesting, but actually all the techniques I'm showing you, they are very universally applicable. It wouldn't have to be cavities, it could be maybe waveguides, but then it might be interesting to put multiple atoms on the same device. And that's also what we can do here, randomly loaded three atoms, and then we put them all on the same nanophotonic device. So it kind of opens up, there are also some ideas that, uh, 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 that, that Alex worked on in, in that Kimmel's group, where you can maybe then couple atoms to the same device and use the photonic field in the device to mediate interactions between these atoms. And, and this is kind of in this scenario, this scenario motivates kind of the parallel entanglement distribution. And okay, this is just like a little theory calculation that basically just says if you have n atoms, you boost your entanglement rate by roughly n because you do it multiply. So this is what we are working on. We are quite serious about this long distance entanglement. So, so, so we actually have fibers between the University of Chicago, other National Lab, Fermi Lab, and we hope to distribute states over that distance. And then here's maybe just a little back of the envelope calculation. We have about 50, 60 kilometers of fiber. An entanglement rate I would expect between now these points, if it's only like, if it's not using any multiplexing, is on the order of 10 hertz, which is slow, but actually, okay, coherence time of atoms is long. So even even at these low uh, low rates, you would still have a link efficiency that's larger than one. That's quite exciting. And yeah, maybe with that view of Chicago, these are all my things in Chicago of places I like. So a lot of fun places. <laughs> yeah, there are many bars and restaurants. So if you're in Chicago, we could explore some of these. Uh, yeah, maybe with that, uh, let me conclude. Let me thank you and thank my group for all the great work. And yeah, this Chicago in the summer, on the river, it's nice. Um, yeah, thank you very much. We have time for a couple questions. So I was curious if we were able to see any changes in the mechanical structure of the nanophotonics from anything, maybe the tweezer or anything like that, and how that might show up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we we. Maybe, I mean, we've seen some little bit of frequency shifts when we shine a lot of tweezer light on it. Um, we haven't seen mechanical effects yet. I would say we also didn't look for them. Probably if we would look for them, if we would look at maybe when I mean, there's probably some resonance frequency with these diving boards or, or little, little, you know, almost like strings or so. So I would expect they are there. The nice thing is always when you reflect the tweezer that many of these effects, I mean, the, the tweezer is just going to move together with the device. It's kind of reference to it. But I do think, I mean, if you're interested in the effects, you could look for them and probably also design structures that actually maybe show that even stronger. Yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. And 
is there a reason to use silicon nitrum or silicon if you're yeah if you're doing if you're doing telecom anyway that's a good question um i mean okay there, there's multiple reasons one is very practical um most familiar with silicon nitrate, right? <laughs> so so works quite nicely. Okay, so so, so that's uh, maybe the honest answer. The, the almost still honest answer is okay. Maybe silicon you can make better devices. Uh, I think. I mean, silicon fab is amazing. Um, silicon nitride is also not bad. I mean, we get Q factors of a few thousand, hundred thousand, so that's good. And then what I like about silicon nitride is okay, the index of refraction is lower than silicon. So this evanescent field extends quite a bit further. So, so, so actually, I think if we were to use silicon, okay, we definitely have to get closer to the surface than, than here, the few hundred nanometers. Yeah. So if it won't follow up, um yeah so, so okay now we're doing more optimization okay yeah you, you're right you want to optimize cutting efficiency so maybe push this up right now and then, like I, I told you, that we are relatively convinced that we are actually often loading on top of the device and get these nice stark shifts. If we really look at the distributions of these, we think we are, I mean, we are not certain, like it could be a distribution over many of these, but if we maybe concentrate on, on these three anti nodes or so, maybe 30% of the cases we are like really in this uh, place. Which is not great in some sense. Okay, you move the atom on top of it, and okay, 70% of the cases you can't couple to the device because you're too far away. So now we are optimizing it. It has a lot to do with the thickness of the device, how efficiently you can transform a free space optical tweezer mode onto like this kind of standing lattice uh, 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 trapping mode. So, so, so we want to optimize our loading efficiency to the device that we could really think of, okay, I have my array here. Whenever I want to connect it to the distant array, okay, I take one atom, put it on the device, make entanglement, put it back. Uh, now if we do that, I mean, of course, there will always be losses, but okay, we already lose 70% just trying to move the atom on top of the device. And then we will still lose a lot of photons, of course, but, but yeah, so, so those uh, things we want to improve. I, I'm relatively convinced that kind of cooperativities probably will be good, kind of given the Q factors and the distance. So I'm not too concerned about uh, cooperativity, but in the end, it's coupling efficiency and kind of coupling efficiency when we move atoms on top of the device. Yeah, more general Internal generator rate and the community. Yeah. So, um, can you maybe draw the picture what this number has to be in order to get certain even back on the number day as well? I mean, like 70 bucks a little bit of the inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, it's great. Uh, I think, okay, it, it is largely dependent on, on the application, kind of. And in that sense, there's also some criticism about this number. For some applications, you actually don't care that this number is below one. If your your goal is to do quantum key distribution by distributing entanglement, this is completely fine if it's if it's low. I mean, it just means it will take a long time, but we can establish a security. Maybe the other extreme is okay, you really want to do distributed computing like this. Now, okay, to actually seamlessly run a distributed surface code. Your entanglement rate here over this distance has to match kind of your processing rate uh, here. So suddenly, suddenly, okay, you need uh, yeah, you need basically as many pairs as you have here across this uh, like like seam or so. Maybe you have okay. Let's say I don't know, you have uh, a thousand atoms for a surface code patch here, a thousand atoms here. So you have maybe thirty atoms along this seam. And now maybe every microsecond you, you, you want to do operations across it. So, so, so then suddenly this number probably has to be like 10 to the seventh or something like that. So, so, so that's the other extreme. So, so it really depends on the application. 
This, I would say, is the most demanding application where you really want very fast entanglement. You know. Lots of orders of magnitude, lots of room for research, so that's great. <laughs> okay. If there are other questions, I'm happy to answer that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you on Zoom. I hope you could hear something. Yeah.